So I just start where I left off? Yeah, just take it from if you were in a close up to a long shot. Ready, Mike? The point about that one, the line of dialogue where he has. Yeah. Okay. Action. So they, they would just laugh. In other words, he, he she would say, here, shoot me, shoot She would just uh, say, take out the gun, and everybody would laugh. Ha, 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 ha. They'd get hysterical. Where, okay, you want me to shoot you? Where do you want me to shoot you? Well, right here. Ha, 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 ha. It was literally, I mean, a shambles. As soon as we would put the flash forwards in, everybody would shut up because they knew something terrible was going to happen by the end of the picture because the flash forwards would come full circle with it in a way. And you would see there were little tiny things. You would see a scene, for example, where, where Robert, the character Robert, uh, would get given the shirt with the sponsor's name on him that he was wearing in the flash forwards. So you'd say, wait a minute, it's getting closer, it's getting closer, it's getting closer, you know. Um, anyway, those were some of the, but now also it was, as I said, it was, it was a, a film that took place in one set only. There, were, there was no way to go outside, there was no way to do anything else. It was also a film that repeated the same activity over and over and over again for two hours and got slower which is a nightmare. I mean, in order to make, to create the reality of the fatigue level, I, I had a real pacing problem. You can't make them talk faster. If anything, they're getting more and more sleepy, more and more tired. So there were some really disastrously difficult things to try to overcome on, on those levels. Uh, so those were some of the, the problems that we had. Jane Fonda credits you with getting her out of her sex kitten image that she had gotten typed into at, at that point. Yeah, she, Barbarella was just prior to, uh, you know, she was films like that. I, they Shoot Horses Don't Think was the first really serious film that she, that she made. And I think uh, had the country not been as adamant politically as it was, or had her political stance not been what it was, she would have won the Academy Award that year. She was nominated. And, uh, she was just terribly unpopular in 1970, and uh, it took her till the following year, and Clute, to to win it. But uh, but she was an odds-on favorite uh, from those two horses, don't they? How was your working relationship with her on the film? Terrific. I mean, I love working with her. I worked with her again on Electric Horseman, and I I love working with her. I mean, she was she's a different woman now than she was then, but but just as professional, just as dedicated, just as serious and uh, just as rich to work with. Jeremiah Johnson, again, is, is a, a Western that, that kind of deals with myth and, and those way things get, get overblown, the whole mountain man thing. It's a big movie, and, and uh, I know that a lot of that uh, was probably from the, the John Milius screenplay. Well, not really. I mean, yeah, yes, the myth, John Milius' screenplay was mythical, as all Milius' material is mythical, but John Milius' screenplay was primarily a piece of violence, as almost all Milius' stuff is. I mean, this, the, the original Milius script was about a guy who ran out and ate trees, I mean, really, and, and ate livers, it ripped Indians' bodies apart and ate the livers and blood and screamed and blood ran down his, his uh, you know, uh, beard and so on. Uh, a lot of the style and size of the piece comes from Milius, but the narrative of it, after the very beginning, and that character of Bearclaw, it, it's pretty different radically. Uh, once once Bob and I began to work on it, it, it got very different. Um, again, mythical is not a word I even knew at the time. Uh, maybe I knew it, but I certainly didn't think it when I thought about Jeremiah Johnson. Somebody told me I'd made a mythical picture afterwards, and then I started wondering what was, what precisely made it mythical. Um, there is something in every film by any director that by which you can recognize that director, I think, and sometimes I think that there's a kind of melancholy in mine. I don't know why, but I, it's what I see in them. It's certainly there in Jeremiah Johnson. I don't know why that is. I don't feel like 
Uh, like I'm a particularly sad person necessarily, but I, but there was something moody and melancholy in that picture, more, more very vividly moody and melancholy. Um, it's, it's a, I think it's a very poetic film in a way, in the sense that it's, that it's, it's, it's one of the most purely visual films I've ever made. It, there's very, if you looked at the script, the dialogue script for it, it's, there's very little. I mean, it's almost a silent picture. Uh, and as such, it's a picture that was made as much in the editing room as it was in the shooting. I was seven and a half months editing hmm. that picture. Uh, nobody knew what it was. Nobody. I mean, our, it was a film where we used to watch dailies and everybody would fall asleep, except Bob and I, because all you had were these big shots of a guy walking a horse through the snow or something. There, you, you didn't know what in the hell you were going to do as a picture. You didn't see strong narrative line, you know. Uh, it's a picture made out of rhythms and moods and a perform wonderful performances. Bob's performance was wonderful, I thought, in that picture. You mentioned you, you know the w working with a writer on that picture in particular. Uh, what was Milius like in those days? I, I know that he told me in an interview that he considered himself uh, somewhat of a saber-toothed tiger, and that, that you guys were kind of were politically at odds. And, and yes, we were. I mean, I I like John a lot. We're actually pretty good friends, and I talked to him quite often. I talked to him when he was doing Conan. He used, as a matter of fact, if you'll notice, the same cinematographer in Conan that I used in Jeremiah Johnson, who was my camera operator on all my early films, who had never been a cameraman. I made him a cameraman on Jeremiah Johnson. And then Milius, Duke Callahan. Duke Callahan. Yeah. And then Milius used him um, there. So we, John and I talk a lot. It's true, in those days, Milius was was terribly proud of, of his sort of macho image and played it to the hilt. Half kidding, half not. You know, he drove around with a bunch of shotguns in his car and hunting dogs and, and slept, used to talk about sleeping with the dogs and sleeping with the rats and how he wanted to kill this thing and kill that. Certainly we were at odds politically and, and I found it after a while impossible to try to do the rewrite with him. We tried once, but I, we wanted to do different things. The fact of the matter is, when I in, finished the picture, he loved the picture. And probably, at heart, we're not terribly far apart. John is a romantic, I think, at heart, like I am, probably. And he loved the picture, Jeremiah Johnson, when it was finished. But on a moment-to-moment -moment basis, my, my way of going deep or into the material versus his way of being more vividly theatrical with the macho or the violence of it was just too difficult. So I ended up working with, uh, you know, with David Rayfield, who I, you know, work with a lot, and Eddie Anholt, who got credit. David did an enormous amount of work, didn't get credit, as David has done on many of my films and not gotten credit. But it was really David and Eddie that, that, that went through the final drafts of it. And then when John saw it, he liked it a lot. What are your feelings today? Uh almost 10 years, uh, 10 years after the way we were? Well, I haven't seen it in a while, but um, I think it, it, I don't know, it's had a, it's an odd film. I mean, it's a film that nobody thought was much good at the time that we made it. Uh, I mean, the studio didn't, and I, I didn't know. Uh, I didn't really either. And uh, then it's sort of, it's one of those films that's grown in stature with time in an odd way. I see it referred to often, and I see it referred to even as, a, uh, like, uh, even with the word classic in front of it, you know, or classic love story of the 70s or something is a phrase I see often. Um, the song has become a standard. Um, so I don't know what to say about it. I mean, I, I, I think it's got two great performances in it uh, by Bob and Barbara. I don't think my p work in it is particularly distinguished or good, but I think I was... Uh, the best thing about my work in that particular picture was my wanting to make it, I think, my uh, feeling that there was really a story there and that uh, I finally got a screenplay, again, with a lot of help from David Rayfield and, and and Alvin Sargent, who worked with Arthur Lawrence, is a very good piece of material. Uh, but I did get a screenplay, and I did talk Bob into doing it. He did not want to do it, and uh, I was able to get a movie, you know, put together. And it's not the best visual work I've ever done, or 
uh, or whatever. But I think it's a s very satisfying movie, and uh, certainly the audience is. Uh Loved it. Is that your most commercially successful film? Uh, financially, no. Well, close to. Uh, uh, Electric Horseman is pretty close to it. Uh, but yes, in terms of, and I have strange friends who really love that film. I mean, friends who I think of as being real cinema buffs, people that I would think would be tougher on film than that, who really like it. I mean, sort of cinema intelligentsia, if you will who you expect to only like Bergman and Antonioni or something, and, and they loved the way we were. Um, when it came out, it had strange reviews. It, people almost apologized for liking it. I mean, Pauline Kael liked it, but she sure fell all over herself apologizing for liking it. You know, it was, I mean, most people didn't want to like it. They thought, oh, this is, what the hell, this is a real popcorn movie, you know. Uh, but with time, then, they, then it doesn't bother them so much to say they liked it. And you've completely shifted gears on the next picture, the Yakuza. Yeah. Well, the Yakuza, I think, is a terrific picture. Uh, I think it's one of the better pictures that I've done. Uh, it's not an audience picture at all. It's a picture that got fairly well received critically. Nobody went to see it. Uh, it's an oddball movie that uh, very few people even know. Uh, but it's a movie that I like a lot. Uh, Paul Schrader credits you with starting his career that was on, on that picture. Well, he, he uh, it was his first big break. He, he's a very talented guy, and again, I had a similar problem working with him. Uh, not as not like quite like Milius, but but it was a taste problem. In other words, uh, he was a, a, an ex critic and a, 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 a real film buff, and his models for everything were films that he'd seen before, and he had approached everything from a sort of a genre point of view, you know, well, let's have a little violence in the first ten minutes, then we can have some later, and I kept saying, I, I don't know what that means, all I know is this scene doesn't work, you know, and, but he was terrific, and his brother was terrific, Len, too, and they, they, were, they were both good, and they came over while we were shooting, uh, Bob Town, Robert Town, came and did the rewrite for me on that. And I got to work with Mitchum, who was just wonderful to work with, and, and Brian Keith and some Richard Jordan, some real good actors, and a wonderful Japanese cameraman named Kozo Okazaki, and uh, spent a lot of time in Japan. And I, I still think that that's a pretty damn good picture. Now, Mitchum kind of harkens back to that, that grand personality style of acting, if indeed there is such a thing. Mitchum is, a, Mitchum is like an old, wise horse. He'll go just as fast or as hard as you make him. Uh, he can do anything. He can do anything. But he'll get away with as little as he thinks he can get away with. Not out of laziness, but out of the fact that I think he thinks most people don't know the difference. And sometimes it's true. You know, Mitchum is one of those guys that the world sometimes underestimates, and they never should, because he's, he's a wise character who knows a lot about life. And... Uh, what you see in that face is really there. You know, it's really been marinated in life, uh, as have his thoughts and his, you know, his whole persona. He's an extraordinary guy. Both uh, Three Days of the Condor and Bobby Deerfield seem to be that kind of big Hollywood package deal type of picture, as a as opposed to some of your your more quote personal unquote type of works. Uh, well, Three Days of the Condor. I don't know. Well, Three Days of the Condor is one of the, again, one of the better received critically of my films. Uh, I think Deerfield probably you could say that about, but Condor, I don't know. Condor ended up being a, being a pretty respectable film artistically, at least if you listen to New York critics. Uh, it, uh, I think it start, may have started out that way, but it didn't end up that way. Somehow Condor exceeded itself. I think it began with Bob and I wanting to have some fun. That's really what it was. We kept saying, why are we always grappling with these horrendous themes and all this heavy weight stuff? Let's just go out and shoot a movie that's fun. It's contemporary. Let's do this. That was when it was Six Days of the Condor, and it was just a kind of frivolous James Bond romp. And then, as is our want, once we sat down and started to work with it and really pulled the scenes apart, and again pulled David Raphael in, I think it transformed itself into to, to something, to something else. Um, 
That film is rather extraordinary of all the films I've done, that and Jeremiah, in the sense that that film has played out all of its runs and all of its reruns on cable and on one network, half of its runs and reruns on a second network, and still plays prime time on a prime network and gets a box around it in the New York Times and gets high ratings. On, it gets one of the best bets box around it when it just did two, sun, three Sundays ago or whatever when it was on. And that's an old film now, it's seven years old. And uh, that film I was asked to have open the New York Film Festival, but I couldn't convince Paramount to let it go to open the New York Film Festival. So I don't know if I would call it a big Hollywood package precisely. Again, that may have been how it started out. Bobby Deerfield, perhaps, like, although I didn't think of it as that, Bobby Deerfield was a film that Paul Newman brought to me just before I made Three Days of the Condor. I had just made The Yakuza, and it was a flop, and I was petrified to make Bobby Deerfield. I loved it, but I was afraid to make it. So I went off and did Condor. When Condor started to do money, and make money, I, I dug out Deerfield. Deerfield is... is a film that I would have paid money to do, probably, which just goes to show you, you should never listen to me. Um, it wasn't a big Hollywood deal film. Nobody wanted to make it. I mean, studios were not clamoring for it by a long shot. They considered it a downer. Uh, it was something I wanted very much to make. And, and at that time, the time that I wanted to make it, uh, Newman couldn't make it, so I, I had to talk Al into to doing it. Um, I still don't know what happened on that film. It's to this day a somewhat baffling. I'll, I'll suppose I'll understand it. Somehow it just, everything went wrong, I guess, uh, in a way that I don't honestly understand. Did the same thing on that film I've done on every other film. <laughs> Although I know that the Electric Horseman had script problems, I, I think that uh, the fact that much of, of, as you mentioned earlier, the fact that you know, your, your relationship with, with Redford, you were able to bring out a lot of that kind of uh, Electric Horseman, character. I literally ended up writing half of every night before we would shoot. We make jokes now about my saying, let's pick the longest location because I have time to write the scene by the time we get there. And that's literally true. There are yellow pads all over the place. We're riding out to work in the morning. I would do, do the scene. Poor Jane would come back and, and she, she, we shut down Christmas uh, for two weeks. And she came back and she said, everybody's asking me how... How's this thing going to end? And I keep saying I don't know. She said, well, "Am I going to go? Am I going to stay with him, or am I not going to stay with him, or what's going to happen?" We didn't even. No, none of us knew. Just like Casablanca. Them. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. Well, that, that I think responsible for a lot of the, the spontaneity of, of of the thing. Yeah, we really didn't know. I mean, it just that was a film that was sort of made day by day in a way. It really was. Uh, that was something Redford and I got ourselves in real trouble. We had wanted to make another film uh, called A Place to Come to, uh, and we just. We couldn't, we couldn't get it made. We had to abandon it. We had a crew hired, and everybody hired, so we were under the gun. We had to take a film. That was a project that Ray Stark owned, was laying around. We grabbed it and uh, then realized that we had to do an awful lot of fixing, and we had to start. And so we were in the middle of it before we, were, we had 20 pages. Are you still going to get to make that film? I don't know whether we will or not because uh, uh, it's expensive. Uh, Bob's getting on now. I'm getting on. It's a tough film. I, it's a, I love it. It's a film I wish we would have made. So does Bob. Maybe that was the biggest mistake the two of us have ever made, is not to make it. Maybe we'll make it one day. We're not rolling, are we? Yeah, we're still rolling. Okay. On Absence of Malice, um, how did you come to, to make that picture? That was a screenplay that my agents sent me. It was as simple as that. Um, I had met the guy, Kurt Ludke. It was his first screenplay. I'd met him because a friend of his worked for me matter of fact, and brought him over while he was writing it for Orion Pictures, Orion and George Roy Hill, as a matter of fact. When Orion passed on it, um, I thought it was interesting. I, I didn't think it worked as a screenplay in its first form, and uh, Kurt and I worked very hard together, and again, we brought David Raphael in to work with us, and, uh, and finally got a, a viable screenplay. That was another screenplay that not everybody wanted to make. I first sent it to Warner Brothers, and they did not want to make it. Wonderfully received film too. Yes, it was very well received, and it did and it did very well commercially, uh, considering its relative seriousness. Can you talk uh, briefly about Tootsie. Tootsie is a Tootsie is a comedy, a contemporary comedy about a man who can't find work as a male actor, so gets work as a female actor, 
uh, and then it's a, becomes a comedy of errors. He falls in love with his leading lady who thinks he's her best girlfriend. Her father falls in love with him. Uh, he leads a double life. Um, I hope, like any good film, that it's more than just a comedy. I hope it's eventually about a man who learns to be a better man for having been a woman, in a way. And I hope even more than that that maybe it's about the fact that uh, the real cement of a relationship is friendship. Uh, and that's independent of sexuality sometimes. I mean, what does happen between these two people who eventually we hope will become lovers is that they become best girlfriends first. And as he says at the end of the picture, look, the hard part's over. We're friends already. Uh, most men and women are, have some sort of adversary relationship in one form or another going, even when they're quite close. And uh, so it's a way to explore some of those ideas and hopefully still be entertaining. It's a more overt and broad comedy than I've ever done before, and that's really one of the reasons that I wanted to do it. You're wearing two hats in that as director and actor. Excuse me, I'm going to the last tape. Okay.